talk to you about CoffeeScript, which is basically JavaScript, um, the good parts. My name is Sebastian Deutsch. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Nine Elements. We are a consulting shop, but we also do Imagely, which is an uh, image sharing service for Twitter, and Watch Later, which is an iOS app. And <clears throat> before I talk about CoffeeScript, I want to talk about JavaScript. And why is it a little fail? Um, <coughs> JavaScript is a very easy language. It's easy to learn, but it's very easy to shoot yourself in your foot. And all the little quirks about the languages are depicted on the website, what the fuck JS, you can see what you can do wrong. And um, <clears throat> there's a little theory on the internet um, about why this language is, is bad. I want to show you that, give you a little history in, in programming languages. In 1958, John McCarthy created Lisp. In 1973, Dennis Ritchie created C. Uh, ten years later, Jana Sostrup created C++, and uh, Guido von Rossum created Python in 1991. Uh, James von Gosling created Java in uh, 1995, and Ben and I created JavaScript in 1995. So, one question. Do you notice something when I presented you this language designers? Look at them, yeah? He has a beard, he has a beard, he has a beard, he has a beard, he has a beard either. What the fuck? No beard. Ben and I has no beard. So meet the facial hair theory of computer science. It says like every great language has to be created by a guy who has, have, has to have an epic beard. Uh, this joke was uh, coined by Bodil Stocker. Um, I borrowed it. Uh, so CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript is an alternate uh, syntax for JavaScript. It's a preprocessor uh, and it really embraces uh, expressive code. Um, the compiler uh, is based on JSON, which is a JavaScript uh, version of Python. Uh, in Rails, uh, it easily integrates via the asset pipeline and it's available as a Node.js utility. So if you want to get started, you just uh, install Node and then you need NPM, which is a package manager for Node, and then you can install it and use it from the command line. So what are the ingredients of this language? Um, here I have a little piece of JavaScript. It's a square function and a cube fu function. And the first step is that we remove the visual noise that this language has. We don't declare the variables explicitly. Remove, uh, we remove the parentheses and we remove the semicolons. And uh, it just works. So uh, how does CoffeeScript do blocks when you have no parentheses? You do it with significant white space, like in Python. Um, this is something that every Ruby programmer has like, oh, a significant white space, I don't like it. But uh, if you get used to it, it's, it's kind of it's cool. And uh, you don't have an explicit function keyword. You just uh, have the parameters in, in, in normal parentheses, and then you have the arrow operator, which is like the keyword for the function. And this is CoffeeScript. And if you compare this to this, the code gets like all the visual noise is removed. And you totally ex understand what's happening there. Um, Defining variables is uh, quite straightforward, like in other languages, unless in CoffeeScript you don't have to declare them explicitly. Uh, one nice feature that I'm not quite sure about is like if you have a, a long array, you can split it up in multiple lines and, and leave out the last comma in each line. Uh, be careful, this is not a two-dimensional array, it's a one-dimensional array. But really straightforward. Uh, if you want to define objects, uh, you can do it classic style or YAML style especially when you do a lot of front-end programming and you pass large objects with options and callback functions, uh, the YAML style makes the code really structured and, and readable. Uh, you have if-then-else control structures. Um, you have an if, you have an unless, like in Ruby, which is the opposite of if, and um, you can use it uh, either prefix or postfix to an expression. Um, expressions, this is another feature in CoffeeScript, Almost everything is an expression, so you can do whatever you want uh, when you're using this control structures. You have a switch statement, uh, switch when, uh, with a default case, else, nothing special here. You have try, catch, and finally. Um, and it g gets fun when, you, when, you're doing, when you're iterating over arrays. You define an array, and you can iterate over all arrays using the for in loop. Um, you can use this either prefix or postfix. And if you take a look at the generated JavaScript code, you will notice 
that um, CoffeeScript is generating a length variable where it's assigning the length of the array. This is a typical JavaScript rookie mistake that people who are writing for loops in JavaScript, they're accessing the array all the time. So CoffeeScript is also going for performance. It takes that for you and you don't have to do that, you don't have to worry about this. We have uh, a while loop and the opposite an until loop. Pretty straightforward here as well. So we got the basic ingredients now, but uh, CoffeeScript also has some really spicy features. Um, as I showed you on the slide with a, with a loop, if you take these three lines of code, they're taken from a, from a game loop where a lot of asteroids are, are working around the, the uh, screen and we want to check if they are colliding. So we're gonna check for every asteroid in an asteroid array uh, if they're overlapping, unless it's not the same, and if so, um, we're gonna explode that asteroid. And if you write that code, you can, and if you read it again, it's very, very readable. If you take a look at the JavaScript um, pendant, you will see that there are a lot of language specifics you have to check, and if you see these lines of code, it's like three lines of code, where there's 12 lines of code, and this is not very readable at all. So it really embraces expressive code with array comprehension. Uh, one of my favorite features is uh, the fat arrow. The fat arrow is if you define a function, you can call that function with an arbitrary context. When you do a lot of front-end development, you might have, and you're, you're starting with JavaScript, you might have noticed that the, this keyword in your content is sometimes not what you expected. For example, in this uh, jQuery example, you, you will see that if you're using a regular, a regular function operator, um, that this will be the DOM element. But usually you don't want that. Usually you want uh, the, that this is the scope of the function you're calling. And uh, what you're doing in JavaScript, you're using um, a bind function and um, binding the function scope context to the function manually. You do that often in, in jQuery. And CoffeeScript does all that heavy lifting for you. Uh, you just have to use the fat arrow, and it generates um, a bind function for you, and this bind function will take care that the correct scope is bound to the, to the callback function that you're using. Um, classes. Um, JavaScript beginners are always asking like how to do uh, inheritance in JavaScript and JavaScript provides a, a, a mechanism which is called prototypal inheritance um, which is not very intuitive to use and so a lot of libraries spawn that, um, taking, that deal with that problem and um, CoffeeScript baked that problematic right into the language so they're providing you uh, a basic class system uh, where, you, where in behind the scenes an extend function is generated and underlying they're also using prototype based inheritance but you can also access with a super attribute every super functions or super properties of your inherited classes. Uh, within the functions add is a shortcut to this like in Ruby. Uh, if you do that within the function uh, it's accessing instance variables. If you do this within the class then it's a static class variable. Um, you also have open classes, something like this. You can open a, a namespace and add another function. Um, here's the coffee script and on the, <coughs> on the bottom is the JavaScript. Uh, though I would not recommend to pollute the global namespace. This is a bad habit. Don't do that. Um, so we got the ingredients, we got the spice, and we also got some sugar. Um, we have string interpolation like in Ruby. We have um, one of my favorites, the existent operator. Uh, it will check, you just append um, a question mark to your variable or a function, um, and it will check for undefined or null. And you can also put it in, a, in an uh, assignment expression, um, so it will set if it's not set before, or you can append it to any function call and see like, if there is an object coming from. This is something similar in your views, like try in Rails, and uh, if you look at the JavaScript code, especially when you do a lot of, of view programming, and you, sometimes you have an object, sometimes it has certain properties, you don't want to write, if the property is there, then print it out. If not, you don't want to do that. And it's cluttered code, and this code is much more readable. 
Um, if we're not sure how many arguments a function will take, we have splats. Um, <coughs> you end uh, an argument with three dots, and uh, it's going to be used as an array in, in JavaScript. It can be used as an array. Uh, we have a destructuring assignment, so if you're going to return multiple values in an array, you can immediately assign them into some variables in, in another state. Uh, I haven't used that very much, but that's a cool feature. We have a lot of nice aliases. You know, uh, is compiles to equal to equal? Isn't this the opposite? We have not and and. We have or. We have <coughs> on and yes, which uh, compile to true. We have often no, which compile to false. Um, add is a shortcut for this, and off compiles to in. And this is, the code gets really speaking. Like, try to use the features. You, can, you can't do it uh, otherwise, but it gets really speaking if you use all that stuff. And last but not least, or almost, chain comparisons, uh, which are borrowed from Python. And we have, like, um, extended regular expressions. We have string interpolation for regular expressions, but we also, who of you are writing regular expressions on a regular basis? Okay, some people are doing. So when you write a regular expression and you define, like you're thinking about how to match several patterns in your string, and you write that, it feels good. You write that like uh, all the classes, the characters have to go in, and while you're writing it, it's okay. But if you come back two weeks later and you stare at your regular expression, I have often that it stares back at me and I have no clue what's going on. So um, you can split it up into several lines and add some documentation, what the uh, matching parts are doing, and I think this is a really cool feature. So now we got everything. We got the ingredients, we got the spice and the sugar. Um, what tools are around for CoffeeScript? Uh, in the Rails, it's already baked in the asset pipeline. It's pretty easy to do there. Just append your JavaScript with .coffee and start hacking CoffeeScript right away. If you don't have a Rails 3.1 asset pipeline on hand, uh, I would go for Guard, which is a basic file watcher. Uh, it is also used for if you're checking your aspect test or whatever. And it does like Guard CoffeeScript and it's pretty straightforward. If you want to go for something uh, CoffeeScript only, you could use Cake which is um, uh, the coffee script pawned on to Rake. Um, and there are examples on the side how to do file watching with this one either. Um, if you are writing a lot of one pages, coffee script got very popular, uh, accompanied by Backbone. And Backbone is, is a system to write like one, page, one pages. And if you do a lot of coffee script, and then you're in the browser and you need to do some debugging. You really want to not to write then JavaScript anymore. You want to have like CoffeeScript all over. And um, you can install Coffee Console for Chrome. There's uh, something similar existing for Firebug. Um, and uh, you install it, and then you can hack CoffeeScript in your, in your console and, and check for variables or check for the state of some objects or whatever. Um, some people of you might not start from a greenfield project. Like if you have a new project, it's easy to say, okay, we use asset pipeline and we use uh, CoffeeScript from the beginning, but some of you have a lot of JavaScript codes. And there's a neat little program, it's um, js to coffee You install it with NPM, and uh, it just compiles your JavaScript code to CoffeeScript. Um, it does that very straightforward, so it's not very optimized CoffeeScript code, but it's a good start. So um, if, you, if you have like a large code base in JavaScript, you can, whatever code you're touching, you can transfer to CoffeeScript. And, and start migrating softly. And last but not least, there's a template engine for front-ending, which we created uh, at our company, it's Hamel Coffee, because <clears throat> we did a lot of like um, backbone development, and we didn't want to have like coffee script in the back end, but in the front end, in our views, we have to use JavaScript because all the template engines are written in JavaScript. And so we created Hamel Coffee so that we can use Hamel on the one side and coffee script on the other side. Check it out, it's a, it's a cool library. So to close a little history, this is the creator of CoffeeScript. It's, Coffee Script. it's Jeremy Eskenas, and it's, it's a good language. CoffeeScript is really an awesome language, but he has no beard. So the facial hair theory of computer science is definitely debunked. So 
Why are we are doing that? It's like we, Nine Elements switched really, really early to CoffeeScript, and I've written JavaScript for over a decade, and I was quite happy with it. Um, and for us, there was a moment like with, it was similar to the regular expressions. If you're writing JavaScript code and it flows out and you're doing all that car callbacks and you're writing functions and you're passing functions around, when you're writing it, it feels very, very good. Uh, but after three months, maybe you do another project in between, the code somehow gets cold. And when you get back at your own code, you're reading it and you say like, what the fuck have I done there? Why am, what, I don't know. Uh, and it's not very readable, it's not very maintainable. And uh, with CoffeeScript, I never had that problem. With CoffeeScript, I always like write code um, that is really readable again, and it's almost no visual noise that I have there. So what are the do's of the language? Make use of all the features you have learned today. Yeah, try to like, Maybe start with JS to Coffee, convert some, some JavaScript into CoffeeScript, and then apply, like, look at all the topics I discussed here and try replacing some JavaScript code, optimize it so that you're going to embrace, like, that you have speaking code. So what are the don'ts? Care about your indentation. So if you write nested callbacks, maybe you get something from Redis and, and you're always checking it. if it's not in Redis, you call a MongoDB or you read something from a static file, you will have like a tree of indentation. Uh, if you're at indentation level four to eight, maybe start factoring out blocks uh, into, into separate methods, even if they don't get called or just called once. Um, it's a basic refactoring step. Um, if you need performance, if you're sure that like you have a JavaScript function and it's called like one million times, then maybe don't go for CoffeeScript. By CoffeeScript, it generates a little overhead. And um, also, if you're using, if you're targeting a special uh, JavaScript uh, engine like V8, uh, CoffeeScript does not have like code, annot code annotations for the global closure compiler. Um, so don't use CoffeeScript there. And also, if you're relying on sp special uh, ECMAScript 5 features like getters and setters, um, they have not, since they are not 100% standardized, they have not landed in CoffeeScript yet. Um, so if you're relying on these, I wouldn't go for CoffeeScript either. So what's in the laboratory? So what's in the making? Um, if you want to go beyond CoffeeScript, you should check out Coco, which is a more radical approach and uh, which is a lot of features that have landed in CoffeeScript were tested out in Coco, so if you want to do the really bleeding edge development thingy, then you should definitely check out that product, project. Um, you have Uberscript, um, which is a fork of CoffeeScript that adds uh, code annotations um, for, for the Google Crozier compiler, but I don't know. I think when I, when I looked at the project, it looks quite good, but I haven't seen any activity in the last month, so. I just guess it was a one-shot um, try to, to realize that, but it's not adopted by the CoffeeScript community. And last but not least, there's a really interesting project that is called Ice CoffeeScript. And Ice CoffeeScript does something real cool. It adds two more keywords to CoffeeScript, and the keywords are await and defer. Um, have anyone used deferred objects in jQuery? It's um, it's a try, oh, it's bad to read, I guess. Um, it's a try to uh, streamline your program flow. So as I, in my example before, when I talk about like, try to get some data from Redis, if it's not there, try to fetch it from the database, from MongoDB, whatever, or from a static file or whatever, you will have like a callback tree. And uh, what Ice CoffeeScript basically does is it adds the await keyword where you do um, where you call a function and it comes back at what time ever and you're going to defer the result in a specific variable. And in uh, the later program code, you can rely that this variable is there and Ice CoffeeScript is generating this, the code for you uh, that is doing the function call. So you don't have a lot of Christmas tree code. Um, your code gets very, very streamlined. But Ice CoffeeScript has also a downside. So um, when I talked about people um, initially about JavaScript and CoffeeScript comparison, 
um, they were asking me, like, isn't it hard to debug? So if you do a typo or if you use a wrong object or whatever, um, is it like if you look at the generated code, can you read it? Can you see where the error is in CoffeeScript? And actually, I never had any problems with that one. Um, figuring out in my JavaScript code, which is the, the bad guy in the CoffeeScript code. But when you use Ice CoffeeScript and you're doing more complex stuff, then a lot of callbacks are generated. And if you got like a huge stack trace uh, in Node.js, you might get lost. So I'm not quite sure. I think it's a, it's a cool development. It's good to push the boundaries, but I'm not quite sure about this one. So thank you. Um, Any questions? Sorry for the balloon. Yeah, you better digest that. Well, yeah, okay. Because Elliot will based on a lot what, what you were talking about, right? A simple question. Um, what do you do about testing uh, for CoffeeScript? Yeah, you could do... Um, we tried out a few when we've written uh, Hummel Coffee. Uh, we used Expresso. Um, but uh, we switched them to Jasmine because it's better. And they play very well. It's like all the testing frameworks, if you use it with coffee, it almost reads like our spec. Any more questions? Hi, um, I've got a question about the um, um, HTTP layer. Uh, what do you usually uh, how, how do you manage actually CoffeeScript on the uh, client side? I mean, uh, in Ajax, and uh, when you have to actually access a DOM object. Um, I found it really cool when I can actually uh, play with, in the console in like a Google Chrome or so uh, with uh, like DOM object. And there's no such a um, console for. Uh, Yes, there is actually. There is, is Chrome, there? there is Chrome console, and you can play in the console with CoffeeScript. Yeah, but this console is not not any close to that um, which is in the in the Chrome, isn't it? It adds another tab to your to your inspector and which is like CoffeeScript, and I don't actually for me it, had no, it has no downside that I could do in the regular console, which I can't do in Chrome console. Hi, uh, I got a question about uh, IDE support, and uh, uh, I heard that Google is planning to put some f uh, new features in uh, developer in their developer types who actually can debug CoffeeScript. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Is that, that going to happen? Um, yes. There's a lot of uh, support for almost every text editor around, but um, I guess it will take some time if it will make it into a real IDE. I haven't heard about that someone has integrated and do like some reverse thingy. They had some discussions within the community on how to, on how to do that, like generating a line number comment above like every JavaScript to trace back where, which CoffeeScript line result, resulted some uh, expression, but uh, it ha it's not there yet. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Can you take the mic? Yeah. Can you can you pass the mic because? I'm Yeah, yeah uh, the support for source map is what you're talking about. Uh, just landed a WebKit nightly, so it's uh, in Chrome and in WebKit, but not in the stable releases right now. It's in Chromium. In Chromium, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, there is like support for mapping the line number from JavaScript to CoffeeScript and maybe. Okay. Cool. Uh, also, you mentioned that uh, sometimes you want to use regular JavaScript when you want it uh, to be fast. Uh, do you plan on support? Can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, you mentioned that you want to regular, use uh, regular JavaScript when you want a function to be fast because uh, CoffeeScript generates some overhead. Yeah. Uh, do you plan on adding like a syntax for CoffeeScript that you can uh, put there that that's inline JavaScript, for example, and don't preprocess it? Uh, yeah, for me, I see JavaScript as the assembly language of the web. 
So you can do a lot of stuff with it and it can be really fast. And if you like have compilers who are generating JavaScript, they cannot be as smart as a human. So uh, the rule of thumb for this is do extensive profiling on your functions. If you write a huge JavaScript app, um, just like create yourself a mechanism to, to see how, ma how often the function will be called, like use some Chrome tools or whatever. And if you identify a function that is called like really, really often, like 50,000 times, like within a certain time frame, um, then you should like do some code annotations for V8 or do some, some manual optimizations. Fortunately, they play very well because like you can mix up JavaScript, CoffeeScript, you just include it and it works. So uh, basic JavaScript syntax uh, is uh, evaluated straightly uh, through CoffeeScript. If you write JavaScript inside a CoffeeScript file, uh, does it uh, do something? Does it throw errors or whatever? Uh, yeah, you can write. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't suggest to do that. Usually, you're going to factor it out in a in JavaScript file, which lives like solely inside a, its own namespace. You don't mi mix up. You can mix up JavaScript with CoffeeScript, but it's not very recommended. It's like the last resort fallback. Yeah, one more question here. Okay, probably just my mic. So we had this conversation about uh, it's quite equal, so you know, where it's double. And like in CoffeeScript, there is no quite possibility to do that. Have you missed it or have you heard about like what's... No, I have never missed it. And there was a, like a famous blog post several years ago that you should always use the triple, triple equal one uh, and throw the other one away. And I'm glad that CoffeeScript actually did that for me. Is there any other deprecations kind of from JavaScript language like this? No, actually not, not something that I see. Maybe the and and the or. I have always wondered why I have to like cannot write and and or with like double pipes or and and. Why I have to be it like very C-ish. But um, this is probably like Ben and I cranked that language out with like 10 days or something. And yeah. <laughs> and one more. Yeah. Yeah, pass it on. Great. Yeah. Um, so, and why JavaScript generated from CoffeeScript has so many semicolons? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the drama. Um, semicolon insertion. <clears throat> maybe we could leave it out. Maybe yes, maybe not. Um, I would leave it in because it's always intended to separate, and you can, like, the code gets less readable with all the semicolons, but if you really, if you have to support really old browsers like EE Pre6 or something, probably you don't have to do that. Then uh, <coughs> JavaScript uh, is not that reliable with semicolon insertion. I think maybe Kate should have some optional <laughs> parameter. To or you use CoffeeScript and then you don't have to write any semicolons at all. So don't worry. Do you want to pass the mic? Is it is it possible to convert CoffeeScript into Dart if necessary? Also, I don't think so. Um, I'm not quite sure. No. Okay. Let's, okay. Let's let's call it. Thank you.